Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you who are connected today. I appreciate it very much. This is our last Bible study for the year. I see you, Bernita. God bless you. Welcome to you, others who are connecting. I appreciate it very much. Come in the room. Sister Hazel Slayton is with us. Bless you, Sister Slayton. I appreciate uh, y'all joining us virtually today. Uh, Latanya, God bless you, Latanya. Good to see your name come up. God bless you. This is again our last study of the year. Stanley Hunter is with us. We're going to be on lesson 30 today. This is our 30th lesson on the parables of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll let you know what uh, we'll be starting with during the month of January. But I certainly have enjoyed looking at these parables and the truths that they convey. Sister McKissick is with us. And Craig Hill, God bless you. Good to see you all. Sister Felinda Woods, God bless you. Good to see your name come up today. We're going to be looking at uh, the parable of the persistent widow. Sharman Mitchell is with us. The parable of the persistent widow. That's in Luke 18. So get your Bibles and open them to Luke 18. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Welcome, Sister Seabrook. Welcome, Karen. God bless you. Good to see you all connected today. We are on lesson 30 and our last. There are still a few parables left that we didn't look at, but we've done, including today, 30 of them. And so I'm, I'm grateful that we've had this opportunity uh, and all of those weeks together to look at the parables of Jesus Christ. All right. Welcome, Sister Dumas. God bless you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day, for all of your blessings. Thank you, God, for the gift you have given us of salvation, the privilege of prayer, and now the opportunity to study your word. We thank you for this time we're sharing together. Pray that you would grant us understanding, God, and then uh, manifest the power that comes from the application of your word in our lives, in our relationships in our interactions, God, in every way. We love you. We give you the praise in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Hey, Brother Dix is with us from Rochester, New York. Brother Julius Dix, God bless you. Good to see you today. All right, Sister Tanya Hill is along with Brother Craig Hill. They're both watching. God bless you. Charlene Cater is with us. God bless you. Let's take a look. Go to Luke 18 in your Bibles. Go to Luke 18 in your Bibles. Allison Evans is with us. Albany, Georgia. God bless you, Sister Evans. We're glad to have you tuned in with us. Brenda Scott. Hey, Brenda. God bless you. Devon Lemon is with us. Hey, Brother Devon. Good to see your name pop up today. Sister Lillian Hartsfield Brown. All right. Welcome, Sister Brown. Luke 18, let's start with verse 1 and we'll go through verse 8. Charlene Cater's with us. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them what they, that they should always pray and not give up. Stephanie Pryor, Brenda Derricott, welcome. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? All right, that's Luke 18, 1 through 8. Bless you. Uh, who else we got? Uh, Sister Cornelia Horton. Welcome, Sister Horton. I see you. Sister Derricott as well. Bless you. That was Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Some general principles come out of this text. The general principle, and it's really based on the context of verse 1, is never stop praying or never give up in your praying. 
God, hey, Sister Stafford, God bless you. God does not always answer immediately, at least not according to our time frame. But remember, God does not live within the boundaries of time. And if yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all the same to him, welcome, du Brother Douglas Brown. If yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all the same to him, then whenever God jumps in, it's always on time, even though it may seem delayed to us. So from our perspective, the answer of God does not always come immediately. Hey, Marie, God bless you. Um, and the fact that it doesn't come immediately based on our time suggests that if God has a plan, then the best that we can do is pray and pray continuously. Pray without fainting, as Jesus said to his disciples. Welcome, Sister Faye Davis. So the main principle of this text, don't give up in your praying based on our experience of time. God does not always show or give his answer immediately, although God always knows what he's going to do. Y'all see that? Welcome, Sister Marie Leslie. Bless you. Sometimes for us, the wait for God to do whatever God is going to do can be days, hours, it can be months, it can even be years. Go back to verse 1 of Luke 18. We're in Luke 18, right? Verses 1 through 8. Hey, Sharonita. Hey, Pastor Broussard. God bless you. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable. And what's the parable for? To show them that they should always pray. You notice that he doesn't, he doesn't give us a way out of that or say there's a time when one should not pray. He tells a parable in order to illustrate, in order to indicate that we should always pray. No exceptions. Welcome, Von Zell Woods. Welcome, Sister Sniffin. We should always pray and not give up. Never give up praying. God does not always, based on our experience of time, answer immediately. Sometimes the wait is differing lengths of time when it comes to us. And this parable was told in order to encourage us to pray and not give up. So based on that, initial principle the question we need to ask ourselves is how much do we pray i have to ask myself well how much do i pray do i am i consistent am i am i praying repeatedly about things to indicate their importance uh how much do i pray how much do you pray we are we are examples very often, both the church and individual Christians, of powerlessness in our lives. We are victims of impotence as a church and as Christians. And if Jesus says we ought always pray and not faint, that could very well imply to us that the power we seek as a church and the power we seek as an individual Christian is based on the quality and depth of our prayer lives. If he is the giver of every good and perfect gift, if he is creator and sustainer, if God is responsible for all of these things and no one can take his place, then it would seem to me that we would want to constantly be in touch with him in order to receive what only he can give. Y'all see that? I see you, Brother Errol Harper and Allison Evans, Brittany Wheeler, God bless you. Y'all see what I'm saying? So if we are victims of powerlessness, both individually and collectively, it could be connected to the fact, it could be the result of the fact that our prayer lives are weak, that we are content to run into God's presence for a couple of minutes every day, throw some stuff at his feet, and feel like we have petitioned him sufficiently when he wants to spend more time with us than we are spending with him. Y'all see that point? Okay, 
All right, now, let's go back to the parable itself. Verse 2, there's a certain town, there's a judge who didn't fear God, he didn't care what people thought. So this dude is completely disconnected from relationships that are most important. In that town, now remember as a judge, he's a person who has power. He has the power to exercise or exact particular judgments on people in their lives. A widow comes to him and the, the text says in verse three, she kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. So she's coming over and over again to this guy who has the power to make a difference in her life. And, you know, he just refuses her again and again. Look at the beginning of verse four. For some time he refused. What does that mean? That's why she kept coming to him because he kept refusing. Finally, he says to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. So the parable is about, is about an insensitive judge. Because he's a judge, he's got the power to do something about this woman's situation, but he continues to deny her request. What's her request for? Her request is for justice. So she wants, to, she wants him to do something that will balance her situation. She's in an unjust situation, what will balance her situation is for this judge to provide justice for her. Verse number three, there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. So she wanted justice. Now, if this begins in Luke 18 by saying that we should always pray and not faint, another truth that comes out of that, another principle that comes out of that is take everything to God in prayer. Take everything. Jesus says we ought always pray and not faint or not give up. Take everything to God. Pray. Up. Matter of fact, you can take anything to God. Um, look at Proverbs 3 and verse 6. You know, verse 5 starts out, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Verse number 6 in all your way, in all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight or he will direct your paths in all your ways. God, you know, you could bring something to me and I would say, my, my answer might be, you know what, you could have handled that yourself. You, didn't, you know, I'm not no micromanager. You didn't need to bring that to me. You could have, you got sense enough. You, you on point. You know what to do. But God never sends us away saying we have brought to him an unimportant request. Now, there are some things that I believe, I'm not saying that there are not times when you can move on a thing. Hey, Sister Neil, God bless you, Brother Mass as well. I'm not saying that there are not times when you can move on a thing without prayer because God has not only provided us with a connection to him to pray about things, He's also given us principles in his word that we can use to make decisions about stuff. There are some things you already, there are some questions that you already know the answer to. And there are some moves that you already know it's okay to make because of the application of the principles of God's word to that thing. Nevertheless, we can take anything to God. And if we ought always pray and not faint, that means it's okay to talk to God about everything. Now, this is a parable. So in every parable, there are not a whole lot of details because Jesus is trying to make a specific point and certain details are not necessary. He doesn't say anything about whether her desire was selfish or not. Um, what, what he does show us in this parable is that this woman does not give in to the indifference of the judge. She didn't give in. He was indifferent. He didn't care. I mean, that's what the text says, right? He doesn't fear God. He doesn't care what people think. So he's completely indifferent to stuff that might matter to you and me. But you know what she says? His indifference ain't making me know. Never mind. 
I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep, I'm, I'm going to keep rather coming to this judge, seeking justice for my life. And he, he eventually gave in. Look at verse four of Luke 18. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So, so hey, Sister Munford, God bless you. So he doesn't do it because he knows it's the right thing to do. He does it because she was getting on his nerves. She was annoying him by continually coming. And she was continually coming because she was paying no never mind to his indifference about her situation. She was not going to allow the position he adopted toward life to get in the way of what was going on in her life. She, might, she said to herself, you may not care, but I'm going to keep coming. You may be indifferent, but I'm going to keep coming. You may, not, you may not have any sort of compulsion to help me or bless me, but I'm going to keep coming. Some kind of way, this woman believed that if she kept coming, something was going to happen. Y'all see what I'm saying? So she did not give in to his indifference. So what happens? He does, he's annoyed. So because of his being annoyed, he does what this woman asks him to do. He satisfies her petition. So then Jesus makes an application. Look at um, verse 6 of Luke 18. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Right there, Jesus is saying, I want you all to pay attention to this judge who was indifferent to her situation. He says, look at how he treated her. Do you think God would treat this woman like this judge would? Verse 7, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Yeah. Jesus is saying, I want you to get something from this. I want you to contrast the judge in the story with God, the eternal judge. And I need for you to understand that when you come before God in prayer, he is not indifferent toward your situation. He does. There may be situations, but because based on the timing of God and how God plans to respond to things we pray about, it's important to keep praying about a thing. So when we keep praying to God, it's not because he's indifferent. It's an indication of the depth of our concern about what we're praying to him about. And that we, and it's an indication that we're not, that we're not just coming to him about something that does not matter to us. We're just saying words. You see what I'm saying? Jesus contrasts the judge the woman went to with God, our eternal judge, and says, when you pray to him, he doesn't have the same attitude of indifference. He cares about what's going on in your life. But it might also be a situation where you need to keep praying and not faint. Not because God doesn't care, but because he does care. And the repetition of your prayers is a sign that you care as much about what you are praying about. Not as much as God cares, but enough to indicate that it's an important issue to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be praying in the first place. Jay Graham is with us. Bless you, Brother Graham. Y'all see what I'm saying? So that's the application. If the judge said yes, then how much more is there to God's yes? Y'all see that? That's Jesus' point. If the unjust judge, the dude that don't care about nobody, if he would say yes, then think of the kind of yes that God would give you and that God is not the kind of judge that this judge is. Yeah, yeah. Verse number seven, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly, quickly is relevant, is, is, is relative. That's the word I meant to say. Quickly here in the text is relative. Quickly, the quickly in the text is from God's perspective because God is not going to put you off. But when God moves in may reflect the fact that it took time as far as your experience is concerned for God to move. Y'all see that? Beginning of verse that I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Now, so there is a contrast between the judge and the text 
and God is our eternal judge. And because of the contrast between them, that's an incentive to pray. If God is nothing like this man who doesn't care about anything or anybody, if God is the complete antithesis of that, if God is the complete opposite of that, then I've got an incentive to pray. And even if he didn't do anything about the situation today, I have an incentive to pray day after day because I know that the one I'm praying to cares about what's going on in my life. Y'all see that? Okay, now we have this section every week in our study. The section is, why is this parable important? First, the parable talks about the importance of prayer. And so I have to ask myself, and you have to ask yourself, how important is prayer to me? How important is prayer to me? If I write out a prayer and read it, that's okay. I may, it may include exactly what I wanted to say. Um, if I say the same words in prayer today that I say that I said yesterday, that's okay because my concerns may be the same. But understand that prayer is supposed to be a two-way, hey, Sister Susan, prayer is supposed to be a two-way conversation between you and God. It's supposed to be a two. So it's not just a matter of reciting something and leaving the recitation at God's feet. It's a matter of having a two-way conversation with God because prayer was never intended to be a monologue. It was always... Um, uh, it was always God's gift to us to provide us with dialogue. And that's why, you know, I learned years ago, don't really say amen to your prayers until you have given God time to speak to you. Because if prayer is a dialogue, but you say amen after you have said what you wanted to say, then that means you have placed, you have placed a period on the prayer encounter and it's as if you expect God to do exactly what you petitioned him to do when in fact there are many times that we pray when God has something completely different in mind which is why it's important to say uh, thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven y'all see what I'm saying okay I know you do. All right. So that's one of the reasons that the parable is important. Prayer is a two-way conversation, and it is an important conversation that we need to have with God every day. It's a dialogue in which we allow God to speak as well. It's important. I mean, no one, no one has ever been on their deathbed and said, you know what? I wish I had spent more time in the office. <laughs> no, ain't nobody saying that. People, there are people who've been on the deathbed who have said, I wish I had spent more time thinking about the things of God. I wish I had prayed more. There are people who take regrets about their lives and their relationship with God. There are people who take to their deathbeds those kinds of regrets. Ain't nobody regretting having spent less time in the office. Y'all see what I'm saying? Nobody's saying that. So we ought to pray and not faint. Pray and not faint. Remember, remembering this. Number one, there is no praying in heaven. Ain't no need to pray there because you're in the presence of the Lord. But there is also no praying that there is also the fact that prayer is not useful in hell and we talked about that last week because at the point that a person is in hell, that person is eternally separated and on an eternal trajectory away from God so that you're further and further away. You see? So pray now. Pray because prayer is not needed in heaven and pray because prayer is not useful in hell. Y'all see that? Okay. This woman, hey, Tanya Arno, God bless you. This woman, I've been praying for you too, Sister Arnold. Um, this woman is an example of perseverance in prayer. 
one of the things that is implicit in this parable is that God does not always answer immediately according to our time frame. Think about this. If you, hey, Sister Glanton, God bless you. Uh, if you prayed about something and God answered it right away every single time, if God, hey, Sister Porter, God bless you. If God answered your prayers immediately every single time, you wouldn't necessarily feel a great encouragement to pray with the depth of passion that you pray with now. If all you had to do was say, God bless me, and immediately, boom, <laughs> the blessing came. If you prayed about stuff and God answered immediately, that's not an encouragement to pray. That's like winning the lottery every time you buy a ticket. And if prayer worked that way, the whole world would be Christian. Y'all see that? The whole world would be Christian if God answered prayers in that way. Implicit in this parable is don't give up. Don't give up. There's a reason that Jesus says pray and not faint. So don't stop asking. Don't stop coming into the presence of God consistently. Every one of us who is a part of this virtual gathering today has at some point in our lives thanked God for the fact that God took time to do a particular thing. We have appreciated the fact that God did not give us sometimes what we asked for. We have appreciated the fact that there have been times when God closed the door. We have appreciated the fact that God has made us wait sometimes because looking back retrospectively at the closed door or having to wait or not getting what we asked for, we have realized that God knew some stuff that we did not know. Y'all see that? Look at Luke, uh, Luke 11, Luke 11, beginning with verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside the house says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus says, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. You see that? Your shameless audacity, your boldness. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Because you would show up after midnight and ask for something. He says, if you're that bold, then I'm going to give you what, I, what you asked for. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Hey, Carla, God bless you. Good to see you, Sister Carla Wells. Sister Arnold, bless you. Good to see you. Hope Brother Arthur is doing well. We're praying for y'all continuously. Praying for you, Carla. God bless you. Y'all see what I'm saying? Y'all see what I'm saying? Okay, okay. So, so Luke tells us in chapter 11, verses 5 through 10, based on the words of Jesus, that we should pray and not faint, and that we should be audacious in our prayers. Back to Luke 11, beginning with verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? <laughs> See, Jesus' point is, you're not praying to somebody who's like the unjust judge. You're praying to a God who cares about you. And although your answer may not come immediately, it has nothing to do with God's posture towards you. It has only to do with the fact that God knows when we are ready to receive certain things. And so he grants them based on that particular readiness, that person's readiness. Y'all see what I'm saying? Okay, so this woman is persevering in her prayers looking at the, that and what we just read in Luke 11 verses 5 through 13 it shows us 
that God does answer prayer, even though there may be some time frame in which we are praying repeatedly about the same thing. Jesus's point is, don't stop. Don't stop praying and then wait in faith. Look at verse 8 of Luke 18. What does it say? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus says, pray and don't give up. Pray and don't faint. Pray based on the fact that God cares about your every concern. But although that is true, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Will you and will I continue to make expressions of faith by praying even though we're not seeing our answers at the moment? Are you the kind of person who will pray a couple of times and if you don't see or hear anything, stops or are you the kind of person who will keep going to God in prayer again and again until God shows you through the passage of time what his answer is? I've been praying about something with regard to providence for, oh, I don't know, five or six years. It hasn't happened yet. I'm still praying about it. I'm, I'm not giving up. Why? Because I have a sense in my spirit that God wants this for providence. And so I'm praying and believing for it. I believe that. Okay, y'all with me? Betty Roberts, bless you. Good to see your name pop up. Jesus says, don't stop. Wait in faith. Now, look at verse 8 again. I tell you, Luke 18, verse 8. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, that could be a reference to the second coming. Jesus saying, when I come back, will I find faith among my people? But even if that's what Jesus meant when he said that, keep in mind that he wants us, he wants us exercising our faith now. We have no idea when he's going to return, but he wants us to exercise that faith now. The only way he can find faith in us when he comes is for us to have de to be developing our faith now and to develop that faith through our prayer lives because our prayer lives are what connect us to the manifestation of God's answer for us. Thank you, Brother Craig. I see you. Uh, our prayer lives uh, are what connect us to the manifestation of God's answers for us. And if we pray regularly and consistently, then that means that we are developing faith because even along the way, you may not see exactly what you have been praying about, but God has a way of showing you signs along the way to know that it's worth praying that prayers because he's doing other things for us in the meantime, while we're praying about something that hasn't been manifested yet. Another thing, keep in mind, in terms of waiting in faith, only take something to God if you mean it. Don't be praying weak prayers. Pray about something that is really important to you. Go to, go to, um, go to Luke 1. Go to Luke 1. We got about another 15 minutes or so. So hang in there. Luke 1, let's start with verse 8. Because here's the passage that talks about uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, before Elizabeth became pregnant. Luke 1, verse 8. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was a priest, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. 
But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Put a pin right there, all right? The end of, uh, or the, the, the middle of verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Y'all see that? All right. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you ought to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. That's important. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. I don't know about that. And he, <laughs> and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Look at what Zechariah does in verse 18. He asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I, I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Y'all see that? Okay, so what's happening here? Apparently, if you look at verse number um, 13 of Luke 1, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. So Zechariah had been praying to have a child with his wife Elizabeth. And when we get to verse number 18, when the angel says, you're going to have a child, what does Zechariah say? How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. What does that mean? He'd been praying a long time and had finally given up, thinking that he and his wife would never have a child because of their age. But what did the text say? God has heard your prayer. So the prayer had been made for a while, finally given up on. Zechariah and Elizabeth were able to have a child. Some, some kind of way, Zechariah had prayed and then just left the prayer alone. He had prayed about it consistently for a while. So obviously, between the time Zechariah first started praying about having a child and the time he and his wife Elizabeth had the child was a whole lot of years because by the time she got pregnant, Zechariah really didn't believe what the angel was saying because it had taken so long, he just figured it wasn't ever going to happen. What does Jesus say? In Luke 18, verse 1, he tells a parable in order to suggest to us that we ought always pray and not faint. Zechariah had released the prayer that he had left with God, believing that it wouldn't happen. Isn't that something? So that's a, that's a reason to listen to the Lord when he says, pray and don't faint. Now, some, some of the most meaningful prayer experiences come after having a sense in your spirit. Hey, Michael, after having a sense in your spirit of what God wants for you in your life and then praying about that thing. Some of the most meaningful prayer experiences have to do with having a sense in your spirit about what God wants for you and then praying about that thing. That's not always the way it happens, but it is a good thing to seek to be sensitive to God's voice and God's will. And then you can, with greater frequency, pray about things with a greater sense of confidence because of something that God may say to you or indicate to you ahead of time. Margaret Williams is with us. Bless you, Miss Williams. Y'all see what I'm saying? All right. Now, sometimes God grants something that is not best for us and a lesson comes out of it. Uh, Psalm 106, verse 15. Psalm 106, verse 15. So he gave them what they asked for but sent a wasting disease among them. <laughs> Isn't that something? God will give sometimes what we don't need, but we ask for anyway, in order to show us uh, how detrimental it is to have 
some things that we have prayed for. Look at Psalm 84, verse 11. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold. Look at that. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. You know what that says to me? That says to me, if God says no to a certain thing. Hey, Miss Fambro, if God says no to a certain thing, you need to roll with it because he got a reason for saying no. What does the end of verse 11 of Psalm 84 say? No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. If he says no, trust him. Verse, uh, 1 John 5, verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Y'all see that? That's the kind of confidence you need to take into your prayer life and, believe, and, and trust that God will move in a way that will bless you if your prayer is within the will. Now, so what happens with, with, um, with Zechariah? Zechariah prayed about a thing and then got that thing but wasn't ready to receive that thing and then he was struck dumb so here's a good thing he prayed about something it took so long he thought it wasn't going to happen but the presence of his unbelief did not abort the answer God said, you have given up on it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway to show you that I can do it at any time and in any, way, and in any way, and I'm going to do it at the most appropriate time. You can pray about a thing, give up on it, and yet that thing does not abort the fact that God planned to give it to you all along. So Zechariah finally ends up with a pregnant wife, and he's congratulated for it. But he can't say thank you for the congratulations because he has struck dumb because of his unbelief. Y'all see that? Mm, that's a great lesson, isn't it? All right. There are times, uh, let's see, what do I want to look at? Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus says, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to, his, to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. God has a way, listening to that verse, of assuring us sometimes ahead of time, before hand how the spirit of god will act as an immediate witness and if the spirit acts as an immediate witness about certain things then all you have to do is pray and wait that's why i haven't quit praying about that thing i told you about that i'm praying for for providence because i believe the spirit of god was an immediate witness about that and God would have never placed that prayer request in my spirit if he didn't plan to answer it at some point, you know. And based on what I'm seeing in scripture, the answer or the blessing might come when I'm done. That doesn't, you know, the fact that it might not happen in my tenure here does not mean that it won't happen. So I have to rejoice in the fact that God hears and answers prayer. Okay, now, verse 8, Luke 18, we're almost done here, we're almost done. Luke 18, verse 8, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's a warning to us about answered prayer. God has blessed us. God has answered certain prayers in our lives. But has it engendered? Has it uh, uh, induced? 
Has it increased our faith? Has it made us stronger in our faith? Now, he does say when the Son of Man returns, and again, that might be implying the second coming. What's he going to find when he gets back? Is he going to find a church and a Christian and a group of Christians? Is he going to find a church and individual Christians who are confident in his promises and who believe that prayer makes a difference? When he comes back, he wants to find us believing. When he comes back, he wants to, he wants to find that we have not given up. That's what he says in verse 8. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? He wants to return and find that we have not given up. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19, beginning with verse 41. Luke 19, beginning with verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. And Jesus said, if you, if you even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He wants to find faith in us when he returns. He doesn't Jesus doesn't want to say you had your chance and you messed up. You, you didn't believe. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Listen to Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. That's a prayer for God to come down. But if God comes down, the question is, are we ready to receive him? Isaiah 25, verse number 9. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That's what we want to say on his return. This is our God. And we trusted him. He saved us. We trusted in him. So let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Don't give up. Think about some requests you've made in the past and how God responded to them or something that you have prayed about for a while and you still haven't gotten your answer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Um, the, the whole situation about Zechariah and Luke 1 and being struck dumb has to do with the fact that when God decided to go in and give Zechariah what he had prayed about, that Zechariah wasn't ready to receive it because... He had completely released the prayer. He had assumed that it would never happen. So the question is, when he returns, is he going to find people who have given up or people who have kept on praying and not fainted? Finally, keep in mind, if God ever says no about a thing, it's because he's got a better idea. Okay? If God ever says no about something, you know he said no. It's because he's got a better idea. His ideas are better than ours. I said this past Sunday, he is the most imaginative, most creative, most powerful, most awe-inspiring being in existence. There ain't nobody like God. Okay? All right. We are done, y'all. We are done. We have done 30 studies on parables of, of uh, Jesus Christ. That whole Luke 15 series of parables we broke all of that up and did that over the course of several weeks so uh, I really appreciate y'all joining me it is 10 minutes till 1 no more Bible study the rest of the year will resume in the early part of January and I'll make sure y'all get that information uh, we, are, we were to have associate minister night last night I mean tomorrow night <clears throat> but it will not happen tomorrow Elder Julia Kelly's under the weather. We'll, we'll, hey, Cassandra, good to see you. We will, we will um, do Associate Minister Night next Thursday, the 22nd, at 6 p.m. Um, I think we're done with our classes for the remainder of the year. Our Sunday uh, 
discipleship classes. Um, so keep that in mind. That'll resume in the new year. We will have worship Sunday at 9 a.m., prayer Monday at 6 a.m. The last Saturday for the food bank is this coming Saturday, the 17th. New Year's Eve service, uh, Saturday, December 31st at 7 p.m., live and um, virtually. Uh, our bass player, Gary Wilkins, will be moving from it from Georgia, I think, up to Jersey. I think that he will be, he's moving there to take care of his mother. So listen, we always do something for our musicians during this holiday season. We want to do that this coming weekend, but we also want to be a blessing to Gary Wilkins as he makes his way. I don't know how many years Gary's been with us, but I know it's been long. It's like, I don't know, at least 15 years or so. So uh, let's let's say, let's wish him well, but let's also wish him well in a tangible way with some gifts. You can give online or you can give Sunday here and, and bless our music staff as well. All right, I think I've covered everything. Prayer list today, my mother, Doris Nesbitt, my Lisa Johnson and family, David Arnold and family, the service for David's nephew will be this coming Friday at 11 a.m. at Providence. Eric Jones, uh, Sharon Lemon, Latanya Cook, Cheryl Seabrook, Mallory Sanders, Thomas Fambro, Bishop C.L. Brookins, Clarence Bowling, uh, Elder Julia Kelly, Brother Robert Ali, and family. Okay? I appreciate y'all. God bless you. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the privilege of gathering and for all of your blessings, God. Thank you for this parable of the persistent widow. Remind us by her example to pray and not faint, not give up, and to trust in your timing, your plan, and your program. We lift up the names we call the day, God, and all of the names on our prayer list for healing, for comfort, for deliverance, for uh, blessings, in multiple ways, God, and manifestations of your promise in all of their lives. We lift up providence individually and collectively, God. We pray for the remainder of our day. We thank you that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Thank you, God, for every blessing. Keep us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, Janae, God bless you. Good to see you. And Sister Stafford, bless you. Good to see you. Good to see you. I love y'all. I appreciate you. Uh, pray for, we're praying for Betty Collier. Keep that name in mind. Whisper a quick word of prayer for Sister Betty Collier. Amen. All right. I love you. I will see y'all when? I'll see you Sunday at 9 a.m. Y'all come on in the house. Be what? Uh, that'll be the, what, third Sunday, the next to last Sunday of the year. See you then. Have a great rest of the day.